In 1917, the Royal Flying Corps enlisted not only men of courage, but men of calculation. Among them was David Randall Pye, a mechanical engineer whose quiet precision would help define the scientific foundations of British air power. Britain's aerial war demanded more than bravery. Aircraft were advancing faster than the engineers who maintained them, and each flight risked mechanical failure. Engines overheated, fuel systems faltered, and airframes strained under stress. They had never been designed to bear. The Royal Flying Corps urgently needed, technically, trained officers who could analyse, measure and improve. Pi was one of them, calm, methodical and relentlessly analytical. Educated at Cambridge University, Pi joined the Corps as an experimental and equipment officer tasked with studying the reliability of early aircraft engines and the systems that sustained them. His work was not glamorous. It meant recording failures, measuring wear, and introducing order to an engineering field still ruled by improvisation. He helped implement structured maintenance routines and database performance reports, the kind that would later become standard in aviation engineering. His colleagues quickly recognized his precision. He demanded detailed measurements rather than assumptions, insisting that mechanical truth lay in figures, not anecdotes. The efficiency improvements he proposed reduced engine failures in service aircraft and influenced the way the Corps logged technical data. Though his role was far from the front line, his efforts quietly improved the survival odds of those who flew. When the First World War ended, the Royal Flying Corps merged into the newly formed Royal Air Force. Pai transferred naturally into research, convinced that the lessons of the conflict proved one thing. Aviation would advance only through systematic science. He joined the technical departments that later became part of the Air Ministry's research division, beginning the shift from battlefield repair to controlled experimentation. At Cambridge, and later through the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough, Pai worked on the study of airflow, engine testing, and structural analysis. His focus was no longer to fix aircraft, but to understand them, to predict their limits before they reached them. He played a quiet but important part in developing methods for measuring engine performance and stress, bringing mathematical discipline to an industry that had previously relied on experience alone. By the late 1920s, Pai represented a new kind of British engineer, the scientist engineer. He saw machines as interlocking systems, governed by measurable laws rather than intuition. Every degree of temperature, every ounce of pressure, could be charted, understood and improved. This mindset would later define British aviation research throughout the Second World War. His research and advisory work reached deep into industry, influencing designs by Rolls-Royce, Bristol and de Havilland. Inside both the Air Ministry and Cambridge, he earned a reputation for intellectual discipline and technical reliability. Colleagues described Pi as composed and uncompromising in his commitment to data. He disliked committees and press attention, preferring to work directly with test engineers and draftsmen. To him, progress came not from bold predictions, but from precise measurement. That belief, forged during the pressures of war, became the guiding principle of his later career. By the early 1930s, his methodical approach had earned him increasing responsibility within the Air Ministry's scientific establishment. Britain was preparing for another era of technological challenge, and the government needed a mind that could unite theory and practice. They found it in David Randall Pye. When the Great War ended in 1918, David Randall Pye returned to Cambridge with a purpose. The Royal Flying Corps had shown him that the future of warfare and of engineering itself depended on precision, not improvisation. Britain's air service had survived its infancy through courage and luck. Pi intended to replace luck with science. At Trinity College, Cambridge, he resumed his academic post, lecturing in mechanical engineering. His students later recalled a man who spoke softly, but demanded accuracy in every drawing and calculation. He avoided theoretical showmanship, 
preferring practical examples drawn from the aircraft he had studied during the war. He encouraged his students to measure, to record and to question, habits that would form the foundation of Britain's next generation of aircraft designers. By the early 1920s, Pye's research in internal combustion performance and aeronautical structures had begun attracting attention beyond Cambridge. The Air Ministry was expanding its scientific divisions and needed engineers who could translate laboratory results into policy. In 1925, Pye was invited to London to serve as Deputy Director of Scientific Research, placing him at the centre of Britain's aviation research effort. His new role was administrative on paper, but in practice it demanded technical leadership. Pye coordinated experimental work at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, Farnborough, engine development studies at Rolls-Royce and Bristol, and academic partnerships with universities such as Cambridge and Imperial College. His task was to ensure that theoretical progress became usable hardware, stronger airframes, more efficient engines, and safer aircraft. He believed that engineering should be organised like a military operation, disciplined, documented, and directed by evidence. To achieve this, he established regular exchanges between the Air Ministry, manufacturers and researchers, an approach far ahead of its time. Engineers from industry were invited to present results directly to government scientists, breaking down the old barriers between public service and private innovation. Throughout the 1930s, as aircraft evolved from wood and fabric to metal and alloy, Pye's department became the hub of British aeronautical science. He oversaw programmes on cooling systems, superchargers and structural testing, all essential for the next generation of high-performance engines. Under his direction, the Air Ministry also supported research into aerodynamics and high-altitude flight, areas that would prove crucial once war returned. His reports were precise and conservative, qualities that earned him both respect and frustration among his peers. Designers wanted bold claims. Pi insisted on data. He would not sign off on a performance estimate unless every variable had been verified in the wind tunnel or on the test bench. This insistence on measurable truth gradually shaped the ministry's entire research culture. In 1937, Pi was appointed Director of Scientific Research, one of the highest technical posts in the British government. The responsibility was immense. Hundreds of laboratories, thousands of engineers, and the task of keeping Britain's aviation research aligned with fast-moving threats from Germany and Japan. His role was no longer about drawing blueprints, but about commanding the flow of information, deciding which technologies to prioritise, which to abandon, and which to accelerate into production. By 1939, as war loomed once more, Pi's organisational framework was in place. The Air Ministry's Scientific Research Division had become a coordinated network of universities, private firms and military establishments, all sharing data, all testing to common standards. Britain would soon rely on that system to refine its aircraft engines and maintain its technological lead against the Axis powers. Sir David Randall Pye had moved from the workshop to the war room, not through rank or rhetoric, but through quiet mastery of method. His tools were not wings or weapons, but records, calculations and coordination. When the bombs began to fall, it was his system that kept the machines of the Royal Air Force running. When war returned in 1939, Sir David Randall Pye's scientific network was already in place. As Director of Scientific Research at the Air Ministry, he now occupied one of the most influential yet least visible positions in British aviation. While others commanded squadrons or built factories, Pi commanded information. The vast exchange of data, testing and technical analysis that kept the Royal Air Force operational. His division supervised work on every aspect of aircraft performance, engines, airframes, aerodynamics, fuels and materials. Research contracts were distributed among companies such as Rolls-Royce, Bristol Aero Engines 
and de Havilland, as well as universities including Cambridge, Imperial College and Oxford. Each group reported its results through the Air Ministry's research channels, where Pi's team compared findings and redirected priorities according to operational need. The system he designed ensured that discoveries were never trapped inside individual laboratories. If one firm improved a supercharger or solved a cooling fault, that data was shared across the network within days. It was a wartime version of open source science, coordinated through the ministry's disciplined structure. This efficiency gave Britain an engineering advantage that no enemy bureaucracy could match. Pi himself remained largely anonymous to the public. His name appeared on few documents released during the war, but his influence was felt throughout the industry. He insisted that every proposal, from a new alloy to an experimental propeller, be accompanied by measurable evidence. Engineers learned quickly that enthusiasm was no substitute for proof. One of the research areas under his oversight was the development of high-octane fuels and supercharged engines, both critical to maintaining performance at altitude. His office facilitated cooperation between engine manufacturers and fuel chemists, ensuring that design improvements were compatible with production realities. The Rolls-Royce Merlin, which powered the Spitfire and the Hurricane, benefited from this coordination. The engine's reliability and sustained output owed as much to laboratory precision as to pilot skill. Pi also authorised extensive testing into aerodynamic stability and structural fatigue, disciplines still in their infancy. The data gathered at the Royal Aircraft Establishment Farnborough informed every major airframe design approved during the conflict. Through his leadership, scientific research became not an accessory to the RAF's mission, but a pillar of its survival. Colleagues later described him as a commander without rank. He rarely raised his voice, but his standards were absolute. Reports that failed to meet technical rigour were returned for revision, sometimes repeatedly. Those who worked under him spoke of a man whose authority came from competence rather than position. He embodied the quiet discipline that defined Britain's wartime, scientific establishment. As the war expanded, Pi's scope widened beyond engines. His division supported radar development, flight testing procedures, and even the emerging study of jet propulsion, coordinated with Sir Frank Whittle's team at Power Jet. Though Pi did not design jet engines himself, he created the administrative and technical framework that allowed Whittle's innovations to move from theory to prototype. By 1942, after years of relentless coordination, Pi accepted a new responsibility, Provost of University College London. The appointment recognised not only his scientific stature, but also his skill in managing large institutions under pressure. Yet, even from UCL, he continued to advise the Air Ministry and the Royal Aircraft Establishment, ensuring continuity in research as Britain prepared for the long campaign that would lead to victory. When the war finally began to turn in the Allies' favour, few outside Whitehall knew his name. But within the Air Ministry, engineers understood that without Pi's system, the communication, the testing, the discipline of data, the RAF could not have kept pace with Germany's rapid technological advances. Sir David Randall Pye had proven that wars could be won not only by pilots and soldiers, but by the unseen scientists who measured, tested and refined. His quiet command of British aeronautical research ensured that when the RAF went to war, it did so armed with knowledge. When the guns fell silent in 1945, Sir David Randall Pye was already guiding Britain into a new age of engineering. As Provost of University College London, he saw that the scientific discipline which had sustained the nation in wartime must now rebuild it in peace. Under his leadership, UCL became a hub for post-war engineering education. He encouraged returning servicemen to retrain as engineers and scientists, believing that technical skill would define the next generation of progress. He modernised laboratories, expanded aeronautical research, and strengthened ties between universities, government departments and private industry, a model that still underpins Britain's research structure today. 
Even while managing one of the country's leading universities, Pai continued to advise the Air Ministry and professional institutions such as the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. His reports shaped policy on research funding, safety standards, and testing protocols for aircraft production. He was widely respected not only for his intellect, but for his fairness. Decisions were made on evidence, never politics. In 1952, Pai was knighted for his services to engineering and education. Colleagues said the honour suited him uneasily. He wore it like an overcoat rather than a crown. He remained modest, content that British science had survived the war stronger than before. To him, titles mattered less than the continued pursuit of accuracy. Through the 1950s, he watched the transition from propeller to jet, from slide rule to electronic computer, and welcomed it all. He believed that engineers must adapt as technology advanced, but never abandoned the principles of measurement and discipline. Data, he once remarked, is the language of truth. Pi retired as provost in 1951, but continued to lecture and consult well into his later years. His influence extended beyond engineering into the philosophy of scientific management, the idea that discovery could be organised, not left to chance. Many of the research councils and technical boards that later directed Britain's post-war innovation followed the structure he had pioneered. He died on the 20th of February, 1960. There were no headlines or public ceremonies, only quiet tributes from those who had worked beside him. At the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, his colleagues described him as a man who replaced authority with reason and rhetoric with results. Sir David Randall Pye left no patents, no grand inventions bearing his name. His legacy was infrastructure, the system of collaboration between scientists, engineers and governments that allowed Britain to innovate at scale. His career proved that progress depends not only on imagination, but on coordination. He had begun as a quiet engineer in the Royal Flying Corps and ended as one of Britain's leading scientific administrators. In both roles, he served the same purpose, to make complex machines reliable through knowledge. Sir David Randall Pye, the mechanical mind who gave structure to British air power and whose devotion to accuracy kept the science of flight firmly grounded in truth.